you uh, mentioned, I mean, I've, I've read a little bit about this, about the uh, sort of the Russians and the Chinese. I mean, I think a lot of people know the Chinese are, you know, good technologically, but as far as the Russians, um, you know, they have um, s- some developments in missile technology that from what I understand, some people say that they've sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, just completely obviate uh, the uh, use of missile defense that we have in Europe. Um, do you know anything about this and whether like the, the actual Russian yeah. history? Because it could be very relevant given, given current geopolitical situation. Yes. I've been following this pretty carefully because, well, I have a technical background, so I'm able to follow it somewhat carefully. And yeah. the real issue is that it, the technology is now mature for hypersonic weapons. So both in terms of guidance systems, sensors, and also the basic uh, aerodynamics, material science to protect the missile or the device as it's moving at a hypersonic speed through the through what could be actually a plasma that's created in the atmosphere. And then also even things like scramjets, uh, which are propulsion systems, sustained propulsion systems for things that might be moving at Mach 5 or Mach 10. The Russians have continued to develop that kind of technology. The Chinese have also developed that technology. The U.S. kind of just dropped the ball and stopped being interested in it, you know, over the last at least 20 years, I would roughly say. So we're in a situation now where the Russians and the Chinese have missile systems that I, my personal opinion is we do not have good defensive countermeasures against. So the moment things go hot in Europe, I think NATO headquarters, I don't think there's any way they're going to defend NATO headquarters. If the Russians want to take it out with a missile, conventional missile, just completely yeah. conventional missile, they can take it out. And same thing with uh, supply and fuel uh, uh, stockpiles in Western Europe. Um, the main ports by which U.S. would try to reinforce uh, Western Europe, they'll be taken out very quickly at the beginning of the war. I, I, th- I think that it's amazing the the people in the State Department or even you know the, the top political leaders in the U.S. just have no appreciation of what a pure, even conventional, even if like hypothetically, which I don't believe we could keep it from going nuclear, if it were just a purely conventional war with either pure competitor, China or Russia, the U.S. is just not prepared for you know, it could be many thousands of casualties on the first day. And that would happen even if the Russians didn't want to minimize casualties. Suppose they just said, we want to kill as few American soldiers as possible, but there are just a bunch of systems that we want to take out on the first day mm-hmm. when it goes hot. The U.S. public, you know, compared to 9-11, 9-11 will seem like, oh, that was a holiday or something because many yeah. more than that number of people will be killed on the first day. And um so I, I just think people have no sense of what they're dealing with when they, you know, we don't have strategic, I don't feel we have really strategic interests in Ukraine. So why are we pushing, you know, why are we poking this huge bear yeah. that could just swipe us with the paw and maul our entire face? Yeah. You know, why, why would we do that? It's just ridiculous. Yeah. So, I mean, I just, I should say for our audience, we're recording this on February 1st, 2022. So by the time this room, this is released, you know, ch- the situation in Eastern Europe, you know, might've changed. Everything we talk about might've already <laughs> come to fruition. So just, uh, just letting people know, uh, know that. So, yeah, I mean, so the situation in Eastern Europe back, uh, from the Cold War, the theory was basically you weren't going to match the Russians man to man. They always had the manpower. They had the ground troops, um, and they had the tanks, right? And we put basically the troops in West Germany as a sort of tripwire. So the U.S. would be involved. What the U.S. had was nuclear weapons. Russia had nuclear weapons too. But the fact that the U.S. had a lot of nuclear weapons was sort of the equalizer. So what you're telling me is uh, Russia still has basically the manpower advantage in, in uh, Europe. It, it also has um, an overwhelming uh, uh, advantage in the air through its missile systems. And, you know, the nu- uh, nuclear weapons, I think Russia has, has slightly more. The U.S. has slightly more. We hope, we hope it doesn't get to that, right? Like, we hope it doesn't get to that. But basically, everything short of nuclear weapons, Russia has an overwhelming advantage. You know, you add, add the energy control, you know, supply control over, over Europe, too. Um, and so it's really, I mean, w- the way we talk about this in, in uh, like, the media and in the discourse, you know, the, that understanding seems not to be there. I mean, it, it really seems like we are overestimating, you know, the U.S. leverage here. Absolutely. I mean, just a minor correction for the military nerds out there. I think the one place where the U.S. still has um, pretty strong advantage over the Russians is in air power. So if our planes get in the air, uh, in air-to-air combat between our fighters and their fighters, we have a significant advantage. But it won't go that way because with missiles, what they'll do is they'll try to take out our air bases right away and stockpiles and things. And so there won't be there won't be the kind of air dominance that we had in Iraq or, or, or other recent wars, even though we do have better planes than mm-hmm. they do. Um, now, in terms of, um, yeah, the balance of power in Europe, I, I just do not think we want to get 
we do not want to mix it up with the Russians right now. We have a hollowed out military that was really, you know, to get promoted in the military over the last 20 years, you were doing entirely different things than preparing for a conflict with a peer competitor. And so we are not prepared in any way for it. Yeah, right. And what do you have a do you have a sense of um, you know the other hot the other flashpoint sort of uh, besides Ukraine is Taiwan maybe a more long term problem if uh, China wanted to retake it um, you know conventionally through military means uh, you know how do you handicap that how do you see the situation there? Well, I think there, there's a significant uncertainty about the actual landing and occupation of Taiwan. So just because of you know an amphibious landing. Uh, you know, involving very large numbers of soldiers, obviously very challenging for anybody. I think the the things which I'm confident about are that uh, Chinese missile technologies for real, and I'm, here I'm talking about conventional weapons. So mm-hmm. I think U.S. carriers will not be operating anywhere near Taiwan in this in the future because they're very vulnerable mm-hmm. to uh, attack by Chinese missiles. Um, the distances between Chinese bases in the first island chain and Taiwan are quite vast. And the F-35 is a very limited range plane. So the ability for the U.S. to reinforce Taiwan in event of conflict is very limited and very dangerous. So I think what, you know, as I was saying, 9-11 seems like the most traumatic event you can think of in terms of loss of human American life. But one carrier group going down and that will be it. You know, the, the president of the United States will, will have a an unbelievable political crisis on his or her hands. Um, and that would happen. Any any carrier group that gets close to Taiwan is probably going to be taken out. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing that which I think people who don't understand the technology fail to appreciate is that it's very easy for PRC to blockade, sea blockade Taiwan, Absolutely. even Japan yeah. and South Korea. Now, those countries get about 90 percent of their energy and over 50 percent of their calories from food imports that come by sea. Yeah. And the state, the current state of Chinese um, ballistic missiles is such that they can put, they can hide their launchers deep inside, deep uh, on the continental, in the continental China. But because of satellite targeting and all kinds of things like this, they can easily just say, look, any oil tanker we see within thousand kilometers of the coast of Taiwan or the major port Kaohsiung, we're just going to take it out and they'll take out one and then there will be no more commercial services sending oil to Taiwan. Yeah. And uh, there's no countermeasure for this because uh, other than going nuclear, there is no countermeasure for the United States to stop China from enforcing a sea blockade on any of the countries that I mentioned. So, um, uh, you know, so they have a lot of cards to play now, of course, at that point, it's just, it's just war. It's just, it's world war three, but, um, I don't think I don't see a lot of really, really realistic analyses of how this is going to play out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, people talk, well, they'll focus on one thing, they'll focus on yeah, the amphibious landing on Taiwan and how hard it is. And then I'm just looking at a map. And I'm seeing here's Taiwan, and it's just China. And then there's just the ocean. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like, what about that? Well, like, if you can't get food, if you can't get energy, like, I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You don't need the landing, you can, you know, you can pass yeah. it on. So I, I, I am willing to say that, you know, how a actual amphibious assault on Taiwan would go is still uncertain, and needs to be gamed out much more seriously. And, and actually, if you if you could read Chinese, you can read all kinds of really detailed analyses yeah. of how it's going to go, both by amateurs and also by the Chinese military. And um, it's kind of amazing because we have highly paid experts in DC who are supposed to be thinking about these things. But I've yet to meet one who actually understands really the what the Chinese PLA is thinking, what even amateur analysts who are still pretty technical, like people with uh, backgrounds in defense technology, even these amateur analyses of how a Taiwan conflict would go are not really incorporated into thinking of our top policy people in the United States. Yeah, I mean, my view, my my view of these things is, I you know, I think you're right. I think we're just not realistic about what U.S. military power can accomplish. We're not realistic about um, how much these uh, you know these uh, conflicts and the backyards of China and Russia matter to us. I guess the one thing I am a little bit more optimistic about than most people, and it's like optimistic in the sense that like you know, I think there's like a 
ten percent chance. Like if you know, if China tries to take Taiwan, like I think there's like a twenty percent chance we go to war instead of like an eighty percent. So like I'm optimistic in my in like yeah. that sense is that I think that it's very easy for the United States to give um, security guarantees when nobody's paying attention. I mean, when U.S. was expanding NATO, NATO um, to uh, you know the Baltics, you know nobody nobody cared. It wasn't like a you know, there was no public discourse, there was no reaction. I, I think back to when Obama uh, said you know there's a red line in Syria, and it was very very easy to say there's a red line in Syria. Um, and then there was a chemical weapons attack. And then, you know, there was a outcry in public opinion. And then basically, you know, Obama just did a, you know, did a sort of a more of a symbolic strike and really didn't do anything else. Right. So it's, you know, it, and this is like, this is like conflicts, which just these countries can't fight back. Right. Uh, so that we're, you know, we're talking Syria, you know, Iran, like we haven't been reckless enough to actually go to war with these countries in a serious uh, way, like an invasion, like we did in Iraq or Afghanistan. You know, I think there's, you know, it's easy to sort of war game how it works out. But I think that when foreign policy, be- like when foreign policy becomes the main issue, um, it's more about what the president wants to do. And he's sort of looking, he's looking deep into the abyss, right? And he's got to make that decision. At that point, it's not, it's not going to be the lobbyist or, or whoever, who the biggest, loudest mouth is. It's going to drive, he's going to be thinking about his own legacy and his own, you know, the, the future of humanity and his own politics right um and so yeah. you know I, I hope i hope you're right yeah. you know because obviously mistakes can happen and so you know i agree with that whole analysis but still the u.s president could make a mistake sure. oh yeah <laughs> yeah so, yeah we, oh okay um, yeah if, i mean if china fights you know goes into taiwan you know like a 10 percent chance 20 percent chance of like a nuclear war is still a terrible yeah. scenario i think a lot of people think it's like a 70 percent chance the u.s would get involved and I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't be as confident as those people. I think a lot would change. If you know, I, I, I think in, in the, in the kind of think tank policy, think tank conversations that I've been in, in the last couple of years, discussing this exact issue, the future of the U S in greater Asia, you know, the point is often made, the following point is often made. So what is the real reason that the U S has to defend Taiwan, right? What, you know, we don't actually have a formal treaty obligation to do it, but why do we have to do it? And the logic is something like this. Like if we give up on Taiwan, it will show all of these other existing allies in Asia that we're not serious. And if we're not serious, then the Chinese will come to dominate the region and we can't have that. So we have to fight in Taiwan and we have to risk actually nuclear escalation and multiple aircraft carriers going, going down in the first you know weeks of the war. So if you, if you, if you, agree with that analysis, then what you're basically saying is the U.S. is going to risk World War III to remain the hegemon in Asia, right? So how important is it for us to be the hegemon in Asia? Is it worth risking World War III? And, you know, I, I think the U.S. president might say, yeah, okay, we don't have to be the hegemon in Asia. No. We, can, we, can, we can let them have Taiwan. So um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what it will come to. Yeah, I mean, but and even if I mean, even if it, you know, it's like it's like even if we don't do anything, right? If you know, if we do nothing, you know, like okay, let's say China doesn't move on Taiwan, but, you know, the, just the sort of the uh, uh, the trajectory of things is such that China is going to be by far the largest economy. You know, it, like there's more economic integration continuing. Um, there, there was just another free trade deal in the last year, uh, the RECP. Um, so the natural sort of state of East Asia is going to be um, Chinese. China being the dominant military and economic power, like even if it never moves on Taiwan. So it's like, if that is like unthinkable, that's like a scenario we have to risk World War III over, then even if China doesn't go after Taiwan, like shouldn't we just go to war with China anyway? Because that's like, it's that important. Well, I mean, if you're Bannon, you're already, Bannon is already, was already saying stuff like that a few years ago, saying like, we got to stop them now, right? So yeah. um, yes, so he was in a sense, self-consistent in his thinking, like, okay, big problem if China becomes the if China, instead of the U.S., becomes the hegemon in Asia, we have to stop that. It's easier to stop it now than in the future. So we, we have to start. I, I know war. Bannon has a pretty out there views on China. Did he actually say, you know, we, we need to go to war today a few years ago? Is that, was that actually his position? I don't know if he, I don't know if, I don't know exactly. Yeah, I don't know if he said that explicitly, but I, I believe that he and Pompeo both think that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that is, that's, I, I, I don't doubt it. I just wonder if they actually, yeah, they've actually said that out loud. Maybe not. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe if anybody said it would be Bannon because he was, you know, yeah. he was not even in, in official office for most of that period. Yeah. So. Right. So yeah, this is, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating topic and it's great to just have a background, someone with a little bit of, you know, technical background that can understand these things. And, you know, I just look at things like GDP and I just look at things like geography. And this is why, like, uh, uh, my, my book on, 
foreign policy, a little bit of an attack on um, the sc- realist school. But the realists, at least, you know, they take ge- geography and they take power very, very seriously. And they can look at a map and they can say, you know, Eastern Europe. I mean, that's that's not that's not our place. And then some of them have uh, actually more hawkish views on uh, China, like like John Mersheimer does. Um, but still, I mean, they're, 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 these people are at least somewhat connected to reality. Uh, while I think a lot of the DC, you know, a lot of the people in DC tend tend not to be. I mean, the, the same people. If you think the, you know, the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, you know, weren't done, you know, weren't run very well, um, and they weren't, you have to just understand this is the same class and these are the same people, and there was no reform and there was no purge after these conflicts. It's the same people thinking about what to do about Russia. And yeah, China. and and to go back to the technology, it wasn't just that the officers that got promoted were the ones reading, you know, Petraeus books on, you know, how to fight insurgencies and stuff. Yeah and not how to deal with, you know, hypersonic missiles. Um, at the same time, we just didn't upgrade our technology. So in this, for example, the Syria conflict where the Russians put, placed a very small presence in Syria, uh, but were able to basically hold off the United States. Um, you know, there was a point at which we launched, I forgot the exact number. It might've been 16 Tomahawks or some, some pretty large number of Tomahawks we launched at, uh, at targets in Syria. And what wasn't really discussed very much is a lot of those tomahawks were shot down these things are going at these are subsonic yeah. so a fighter can go and shoot them down i mean they're pretty slow dumb technology compared to hypersonic yeah. missiles which are you know going mach three four five six seven so i mean that's old stuff and um people who watched the syria conflict carefully saw some interesting things about U.S. versus Russian military technology. Yeah, and just to be clear, you know what you're saying is not just that, like the state. You were talking about the state of technology. The state of technology is not just like the offense is now favored over the defense. It's just that Russia, if you compare Russia's offensive advantage versus the U.S. advantage, Russia's just ahead technologically. Is it that's what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you get into the nitty gritty, like say you want to build a hypersonic missile, you 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 need to, for example, have hypersonic wind tunnels. You need to actually have wind tunnels where the the speed of flow is super, you know, well above uh, multiple Mach. And the U.S. doesn't really actually have any. And <laughs> Chinese have like a Mach 30 wind tunnel, you know, several of them, I think. And so that's a very expensive thing. You need very specialized people. My father was a professor of aerospace what is this? Tell us what the wind tunnel looks like. Just It's just a gigantic, just explain what it is. Well, if you want to model, if, so you want to model the, the right shape of the, the, the missile that you're going to be using, and you want to figure out how superheated it's going to get from the plasma friction huh. as it's moving. You're going to want to develop sensors that can work through that plasma layer. You're going to have to develop materials that can withstand that kind of pressure and temperature. So there's all kinds of really gnarly engineering that's super specialized. It has no commercial applications whatsoever, Uh and you need really smart people doing it. So if you do not emphasize it, it's not going to get done. And so basically, like if you look at recent hypersonic tests of the United States, they've all been failures. Uh Like we we can't you can't just flip a you know go like this and suddenly like oh well we have smart people working at Apple. Uh, If we need hypersonic missiles, we'll have hypersonic missiles. It doesn't work that way. So. The Russians never gave up on all kinds of aerospace, material science, um, aerodynamics kind of research that they were strong in during the Cold War, and they managed to preserve enough of it that they were, they've still been able to upgrade their weapon systems. And the Chinese now are making very, very fast strides in, in advancing their weapon systems. Yeah. Yeah. And in China, I mean, China, I think it seems like they've underinvested in their military relative to um, their econo- their economy and sort of their human capital. So if Russia is punching well above its weight, um, as far as military technology, I think China is still punching way, way below its weight, right? Oh, absolutely. They're, they're at, you know, 2% of GDP uh, on defense and they could, they could easily crank that up. I mean, if you think about where is the manufacturing capability, where is the ship building capability in the world? It's, it's all there. It's not here. So, uh, you know, I, I just think we, we do not want to get into a cold war with them. It's, it's not a good thing for us. 